It's a beautiful prayer. Praise the Lord. Okay. Um, so first I'll just introduce myself. I'm Pamela Cassidy. This is for everyone who's here and for the people who are maybe watching later. My mm -hmm. husband is Jim Cassidy, who's the worship pastor at Crossway Worship Center. Um, and other than that, I have no credentials or <laughs> about myself. I will also say that when Beverly teaches, she makes this look so easy, but <laughs> not, not for me. And I did want to also explain that I use slides and I really have tried to evaluate that in myself. And when I was preparing the slides for this, I realized that the slides are my way of distilling and processing the information. Some people draw, some people uh, mm. do other things. This is mm -hmm. my way of distilling the information for myself. So you'll um, please pardon me <laughs> for just showing slides, but no. um, it, it helped me and I hope that it helps you also. It helps to, us, it does. Yes. Yes. Okay, so I hope it gives you a visual anchor mm -hmm. to walk away from mm -hmm. the session with. I also wanted to add that sometimes we would like to send you information, send you more information than we're including in the studies. And uh, to do that, we would really love your email address, uh, crosswaywc at gmail.com. Uh, please, please, please send us your email address mm -hmm. so that we can send you more information. Uh, the studies are really short. But the book is really rich. Um, mm -hmm. Actually, Beverly, do you have the book? So the book that we're studying is Steadfast Love by Lauren Chandler. It's mm -hmm. a study based on Psalm 107. Very mm -hmm. thorough. Like I said, it's very rich. That's what it looks like. It's a beautiful book. Um, and so what I'm going to present to you today is a real distillation of the second chapter. Um, I wasn't able to hear. What's the name of the book? I just want to write Steadfast, it down. Steadfast Love by Lauren Chandler. Thank you. Sure. Okay. <laughs> Great. So let's see. Let's just dig right in. Um, we're going to start today by reading the section that we're going to be covering. Um, that will be Psalm 107. And this is verses four through six. We can read this together. All mm -hmm. right. I know that on Zoom, it's a little awkward. Our voices might not be exactly in sync, mm -hmm. but our, our hearts will be. So I will read it and you can join me. Um, some wandered in desert wastes, finding no way to a city to dwell in. Hungry and thirsty, their soul fainted within them. Then they cried, then they cried to, to the Lord in their distress, and Amen. he delivered them from their distress. Amen. Oh. This, is, mm -hmm. this is verses 7 through 9. He led them by a straight way till they reached a city to dwell in. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wondrous work to the children of man. For he satisfies the longing soul and the hungry soul he fills with good things. Mm -hmm. Today we're going to talk about wandering in the desert. Um, we'll begin with looking at marks of the desert. How do you know when you're in the desert? Mm. Um, so let's describe the desert. To describe the desert is hot. Mm. The desert is dry. The desert is sandy. The desert is dry. The desert is barren. And the desert is dry. So <laughs> the main thing about the desert is uh, it's dry. Uh, actually, scientifically speaking, a biome is considered a desert when it gets only a certain very little amount of rainfall or less. So there are actually deserts in polar regions uh, just because it's strictly denoted by the lack of water. And that's what we feel when spiritually we are in the desert. We feel like we're disconnected from the source of water and the source of life. That is something that as Christians, we, we tend to plunge deep into, but it's not there. We can't find it. Um, when we talk about Moses in the wilderness, which we're going to talk about twice in this lesson, the people were uh, thirsty because there was no water. And the secret about Moses in the desert is that actually they did have water. They just weren't looking in the right spot. Um, they needed to go to the source. But how do we know when we're in a desert? Uh, the first mark of a desert is loneliness. Um, loneliness is um, a different thing from being alone. Uh, some of us enjoy being alone, but loneliness is when there are not people and you have a longing. You're seeking mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. a connection that isn't there. 
uh, in the desert, that loneliness feels like you're missing that connection with God. And that being the most intrinsic connection that we have as Christians, that is the most, the hardest one to suffer from, that loneliness. The second mark of the desert is longing. Um, longing is a seeking for a connection that isn't there. Um, it's, oh, no, that's loneliness. It's uh, a thirst. Actually, thirst is a longing. It, uh, mm -hmm. The Bible talks a lot about thirst mm -hmm. being a longing. And um, actually, God made our bodies to thirst. We, we are expected to suffer from thirst sometimes. It's part of the Christian experience. It helps us to understand when we're in a desert place that sometimes it's not just a problem. Sometimes it's something that is causing us to seek something better. Hello, Carolyn. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> the third. Um, Hello. The third Thank mark you. of the desert is lament. I actually couldn't see who I let in because my- I know, popcorn. I know. So I'm so glad it's you, Carolyn. <laughs> um, the third mark of the desert is lament. Um, when we think about lament, we need to differentiate that from complaining, okay? Because there, we can complain or we can lament. Um, complaining is a horizontal action. Complaining is when we feel like we deserve better than this. Um, we need to get something off of our chest. Complaining is more of a longing for controlling something. Complaining is horizontal. Lamenting is vertical. Lamenting is um, we don't understand. We're confused. Uh, we need an answer and we need it as soon as possible, but not from the guy next to us. We're looking from God. Uh, lament instead of longing for control, it longs for restoration of relationships. So David lamented. If you read the Psalms, you know, we always refer to the Psalms as a place of um, understanding of our emotions, really. And David lamented a lot. <clears throat> and this is from Psalm 13. This is verse one. He cries out and we can cry out when we're in the desert. How long, O oh Lord? Will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? The desert feels very much like that. When we feel disconnected and dry, we feel lonely. We long for something that we cannot grasp. And we cry out to God in lament. And what we can remember, even, even four verses later, David's answer is not that his desert went away or that his longing was necessarily answered but psalm 13 verse 5 says but i trust in your unfailing love my heart rejoices in your salvation i just want to pause for 30 seconds or so and just consider the marks of the desert loneliness longing and lament so i'm just going to hold my peace for 30 seconds Okay, and do you find yourself in a place of loneliness, of longing and lament? Um, now we're going to consider reasons for the desert. Why are we stuck in the desert? Um, at this point, um, the book's author would like us to take out a piece of paper and draw a picture of a well and a picture of an anchor. Um, I don't have the ability to do that, um, so I drew them for you. <laughs> a well and an anchor. Um, Good job. Well, good job. Thank you. I didn't, I didn't actually draw these. You probably could guess that. Um, the well represents our source of sustenance, the thing that we most need as living beings to survive. We can survive for a, quite a while without food, but we cannot survive very long without water. The anchor represents our source of stability, the thing that holds on no matter what, no matter what's going on, the thing that keeps us in place and grounds us. Seasons in the desert 
reveal the things in which we trust for our sustenance and our stability. I think out of the entire Bible study, this is probably the thing that hit me the mm -hmm. hardest. So I'm going to read this again. Seasons in the desert reveal the things in which we trust for our sustenance and for our stability. We know that Moses uh, and the Israelites wandered in the desert for 40 years. Uh, they started as slaves. They were slaves in Egypt. Uh, God rose Moses up to deliver them. They cried to God for help and God answered them. God answered them and delivered them with a mighty deliverance. He caused 10 major plagues that upended the country of Egypt. And then uh, when they needed him again, they crossed the uh, Red Sea. And uh, God just miraculously answered them. But on the other side of that Red Sea was the desert. And God's people had a lot to work out in that desert concerning sustenance and stability. The desert brought the Israelites immediate relief from oppression like that. There was no more, no more Pharaoh, no more army, no more slavery. But it had to work a slower, more painful relief from dependence. They were depending on the wrong things. Anytime something happened uh, anywhere along the route, they would complain in two ways. They would complain that they wanted to go back to Egypt. They wanted that the water, they wanted the leeks and the onions, they wanted the fish. I don't think they were thinking too much about the hard work, but they were depending on the wrong thing. Um, the other thing they did when they complained is they would blame Moses for bringing them out. Now, did Moses bring them out of Egypt? No, God brought them out of Egypt. And instead of recognizing God's goodness and God's holiness and God's ability to have control, they were looking for something else to depend on and finding Moses and finding him fault, faulty. The thing is, in Egypt, they were used to transactional gods. There were hundreds of gods in Egypt, and you had to make sure that you were appeasing each one. If you did this for that one, he would do that back for you. If you were good to the one that controlled growth of your crops, then you would get good crops. It was very transactional. And God needs to teach them not to depend on themselves, not to depend on a transactional thing. Uh, God is a very different kind of God. He is a God of sustenance and he is a God of stability, not the shifting sands of somebody you have to always keep pleased in order to get what you need. It took 40 years to get 430 years of living in Egypt out of the Israelites. Um, they had been there, most of them, actually all of them had been there for their entire lives, their parents' lives, their grandparents' lives, their great-grandparents' lives. If you think about it, um, the United States has been a country for 200 and almost 50 years. That's not, that's just a little over half of the time that they were in Egypt. So. Hmm. I, when I read that, I was like, wow, that's really, I never thought of it that way. Mm -hmm. Those people were more Egyptian in their hearts than they were Israelite in their hearts because they had lived there in that country for so long. And they had learned to depend on the ways of Egypt and the things of Egypt. God needed to teach them to depend on him instead. Uh, the reason that God took them through the wilderness is expressed in Deuteronomy 8, verse 2. And you shall remember the whole way that the Lord your God has led you these 40 years in the wilderness, that he might humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. So uh, one way that he humbled them and provided sustenance for them was manna. He provided their food, but they had to go out and bend down on the ground and pick that food up. And it tasted magnificent according to the bible it tasted like some amazing food but they had to humble themselves they had to go out and bend down and pick it up off of the ground um, that is sustenance um, it's not the sustenance that they wanted it's not the sustenance that they couldn't go and hunt something and prepare it by themselves they had to depend strictly on god um, the other reason that 
he sent them out there and left them there for so long was testing them to know what was in their heart. And the important part about that is that God already knew what was in their heart, but the people didn't know what was in their heart. Uh, I know that I always think I'm going to do the right thing. You probably do too. We always think that we're going to make the right decision. Uh, even sometimes we plan ahead and we say, oh, when, if this ever happens to me, I'm going to say that or I'm going to do that. But when a situation arises, we don't do the right thing. Mm. We depend on something else, uh, something else that pops into our head or some other plan. Uh, it's very hard uh, when we are tested to know what is in our heart. When, we, when we're tested, we actually see what finally comes forth. And God needed them to see what they were counting on, what they were trusting in, and that it wasn't God. Um, but God's sustaining and stabilizing Holy Spirit is what will keep us on the right course and keep us doing his commandments, as the verse says. Um, the food, the manna that he provided was the bread, was the sustenance, and his testing of their hearts to see their stability was the stabilizing sustenance and stability. That is what is exposed in the desert. And I'm just going to take maybe only 15 seconds. <laughs> oh, oh, boy, I'm not supposed to change the page yet. I'm sorry. What did I do? Hmm. I'm sorry. Oh, it's yes, wonderful. I skipped the verse. I skipped James. Yes, they were prideful. They were full of themselves. And they didn't want to depend on God. They would rather do it some other way. But the book of James says, God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. To submit yourself, therefore, to God. And that's a really hard thing when you are tested to submit yourself to God, especially when you're someplace you don't want to be in the desert, full of sand, full of heat, looking around with nothing, nothing that you can depend on, nothing but God. That is the hardest. It is hard to submit yourself to God under those circumstances, but it is so important. And uh, so now I'm going to take 15 seconds to think about in what ways are you looking for sustenance and looking for stability from outside things other than God? Um, are there things that you're depending on for your water? Are there things you're depending on for your solid ground to stand on? So let's think about that for about 15 seconds. Okay, another way that God uses the desert, aside from exposing the things that we're depending on, is to give us a course correction. Um, I'm sure you've probably heard of Hosea. <clears throat> Hosea is one of the minor prophets in the Old Testament. The first time God ever speaks to Hosea, the first thing he says to him is, go and take a wife of harlotry. That's quite... <laughs> If God said that to me and that was the first time he ever spoke to me, I would probably scratch my head. But <laughs> Hosea actually did that. He sought out a, a, an unfaithful woman to marry. Hosea knew from the beginning that his wife would cheat on him, but he took her anyway. Um, Hosea, the book of Hosea is a beautiful work of poetic prose and poetry in some places. And all of the keywords, every keyword in Hosea is actually a picture word. So um, I would highly encourage you to read the book of Hosea, especially if you can um, look up some of the meanings of words or if you have a study Bible that describes what's going on literally with the literature there. Because it's probably the most picturesque book of the Bible uh, with the meanings and the way the words are put together. Um, Hosea takes a wife named Gomer, and he knows that she's going to cheat on her. Um, and they have three children. Uh, their first is Jezreel. God says, name him Jezreel. The second is Lo Ruhama. And the third is Lo Ami. Um, now, when you read the scriptures, um, it says they, they, she bore him a son, and he named him Jezreel. But with the other two, it just says she bore them. 
it doesn't necessarily stipulate that Hosea was their father. So it's possible that Lo Ruhama and Lo Ami weren't even Hosea's children. We don't know that for sure. But um, as I said, the book of Hosea is a beautiful picture of God's relationship with Israel and by extension, God's relationship with us. God holding the position of the, uh, Hosea holding the position of a faithful God who loves us and calls us and draws us to himself and Gomer taking the place of us with our hearts um, and uh, the way that we tend to wander. The children also are an expression of God's, um, God's word to his people. So the children, Jezreel was actually the name of the capital of Israel under the most wicked king it ever had, King Ahab. And he wanted Hosea to name his son Jezreel because God was going to uh, wipe out um, Israel. So naming his son Jezreel was a way of saying, I am going to judge Imagine naming your child, uh, God is going to judge and wipe out. That's a uh, pretty strong language for a child. Um, Jezreel, the word actually means, may God give seed, and we will see that later. Um, her, his second child, Lo Ruhama, her name means not love. And that is a terrible name. <laughs> That's a terrible name for a child. <laughs> but these are the seeds of wickedness that we see when we do things our own way. Lo Ami means not my people. Mm. And again, that's, that's a terrible thing to name a child, and, but it's a great picture of the fruit of what happens when we step away from God. Now, um, um, God spoke to Hosea um, and told him what his life was going to be like. Um, uh, what's her name? Gomer, sorry. Gomer left Hosea and ran from him. And um, just like we run from God all of the time. And I don't know if you can see these if you're on a mm -hmm. phone. It's hard, we can. hard to read. Mm -hmm. Good. Okay. So this is Hosea 2, verses 6 through 8. Therefore, I will hedge up her way with thorns, and I will build a wall against her so that she cannot find her path. She shall she shall pursue her lovers, but not overtake them. And she shall seek them, but shall not find them. And here we show God putting up hedges of thorn walls so that his people, his beloved, cannot any longer go and find a way to satisfy their illicit longing. Um, then she shall say, I will go and return to my first husband, for it was better for me then than now. And she did not know that it was I who gave her the grain, the wine, and the oil, and who lavished on her silver and gold, which they used for Baal. Um, God told Hosea to go back and buy his wife back. So she's struggling to find a path to what she wanted, and she's not finding it because God has hedged her in. And then Hosea goes to buy her back, which is a beautiful picture of how God treats us no matter how sinful and evil we become, God will hedge our path in and then he will pursue us further. This is Hosea. This is verses 14 through 20 summarized. So these are quotes from those verses. Therefore behold, I will allure her and bring her into the wilderness and speak tenderly to her. And in that day, declares the Lord, you will call me my husband, and no longer will you call me my Baal. And in that day, I will answer, declares the Lord, and they shall answer Jezreel, and I will sow her for myself in the land, and I will have mercy on no mercy. And I will say to not my people, you are my people, and he shall say, you are my God. This has a lot of really beautiful imagery in it. The first thing I would like to explain is that the word Baal um, means Lord in the ancient language. If you were reading along and you saw the word Baal, um, it could be the name of the false god because the name of their false god was Lord. But this is expressing the relationship between Hosea and Gomer that she was serving other gods, Baal. She was, and so she would call the other men her Baal, uh, because it just meant Lord or Master. Um, but 
when her true husband came and took her back, she no longer had to treat him like a bale. She could truly call him my husband. Mm. Um, and if you look in the next verse, um, they shall answer Jezreel and I will sow her for myself in the land. Remember, Jezreel means um, God will give seed. So this is God restoring. The name Jezreel was given because he was going to judge. But through his judgment and through his placing thorn, thorn rows and walls, He's calling us back to himself and I will sow her for myself in the land. Um, he will have mercy on those he said were no mercy. And to the people who are not my people, he will say, you are my people. And he shall say, you are my God. And the same way that when we are in a desert and we're turning away from God and we don't understand it, um, and maybe God is giving us a course correction, and we're uncomfortable and we don't like it we can turn back to him because he is pursuing us there. He is walling us in. He is hedging us in. And we can turn to him and say, you are my God. And he will say to us, you are my people. To summarize what we've learned about Hosea, um, God's promise to us as reflected in Hosea 14 and this is verse 20. I will betroth you to me in righteousness and in justice, in steadfast love and in mercy. I will betroth you to me in faithfulness, and you shall know the Lord. So I just want to pause for a few seconds to think about ways in which God might be calling us back to himself, the hedgerows that we see in our way, and the things that make us feel uncomfortable. It might be God drawing us back to ourselves. Back to himself. Mm -hmm. Okay, another reason that God calls us through the wilderness is to prepare us to bear his fruit. Um, and this is his fruit. Um, so we're going to look again at Moses, but we're going to go back in time. Uh, the last time we saw Moses, he was leading his people through the wilderness and they were learning about sustenance and stability. This time we're going to go back in time from when he first entered the wilderness himself. So we're going to look at Exodus 2, verses 11 and 12. One day, when Moses had grown up, he went out to his people and looked on their burden. And he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his people. He looked this way and that, and seeing no one, he struck down the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. Okay, uh, Moses had early on a heart to deliver his people. You can see that here. He wants to deliver this, this Hebrew from being beaten by an Egyptian. So he's kind of looks around, sees no one's watching, and he kills the man and buries him in the sand. But Moses' heart to deliver his people was misapplied here. Um, when your, your ministry or your exploits involve hidden things and secrecy um, and relying on your own strength, then it's not necessarily God's ministry. And um, so he had the right heart to get his people out of trouble, but he was using his own strength and his own means to try to accomplish that. Um, he was not ready for that, and the people also were not yet ready for that. Uh, so Moses fled to the wilderness, um, and instead of wearing his royal robes and living in a palace and having his bidding done, he kept the, the sheep of the priest of Midian. He did that for 40 years uh, in the wilderness. Um, he probably learned a lot. He was stripped of his kingly vestment. He was alone most of the time. One of the marks of the desert that we talked about earlier was loneliness. He was probably very lonely. Um, and he had to care for someone else's flocks, not even his thing. He was taking care of someone else's thing. Um, the lessons that he learned about sustenance and stability were probably pretty strong. Um, he had to learn not to depend on himself, not to depend on his position but only to depend on God. And um, we want to consider our lives 
compared to or contrasted mm -hmm. to Moses and say, are we, are we looking at um, our way out of the desert? Our way out of the desert might be, um, we might be there in order to have God prepare us for something new, prepare us for ministry as he was doing with Moses. But we need to look and say, are we forcing the fulfillment of that? Are we, are we pushing things our way to try to fulfill what we know God wants to do in us? Um, are we fleeing the consequences of what we've done? Have we tried to fulfill our ministry in our own way and gotten some pushback? Are we fleeing those consequences? Are we settling into life in the wilderness? Are we deciding that maybe it is time for a course correction? Are we deciding that um, maybe taking care of someone else's things is not such a bad thing? Are we getting too a little too comfortable here maybe? Or are we humbly accepting God's call because God knows best what he wants to do in us? Now we're going to look at one more wilderness experience. Um, this is Luke 4, verses 1 through 2. And Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by the devil. And he ate nothing during those days. And when they were ended, he was hungry. Now we're looking at Jesus. Um, we looked at flawed examples before. Um, Jesus always provides us with a good example of what to do and how to face the trials that we're facing. I'm sure that I have never, I have fasted for extended periods of time, but not without eating anything at all. So I don't know that he had to be, obviously he was the son of God. I know that Moses did this too, uh, fasted for a long period of time, but the physical endurance needed to do that and just how uh, mentally and emotionally taxing that is on a person is just incredible. So we need to look at Jesus' example and see what happens when we're sorely tried, uh, when we're in a wilderness experience of our own. So who called Jesus into the wilderness? It was the Holy Spirit mm -hmm. took him there, led him there, and left him there. Well, not left him there, but had him there for 40 days, which is a long time. And why was he brought to the wilderness? It was so that he could be tempted and so that we could, we could thereby get a better example. So mm -hmm. uh, the devil said to him, if you are the son of God, command this stone to become bread. So Jesus' first temptation was for physical sustenance. You're hungry, Jesus. Make this stone into bread. And Jesus answered him, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. This is the sustenance that he is showing us that we need. Jesus didn't need God's word because he was God's word, but Jesus's words here are expressing to us what we need, the sustenance that we need. Yes, we need bread, but even more, we need God's word. And the devil took him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time and said to him, to you, I will give all this authority and their glory, for it has been delivered to me and I give it to whom I will. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. And Jesus answered him, it is written, whoops, sorry. Jesus answered him, it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you mm -hmm. serve. Mm -hmm. And he took him to Jerusalem and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you. And on their hands, they will bear you up lest you strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered him, it is said, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Every time Jesus was tempted, he was tempted with things that might tempt us to, uh, for sustenance, for authority, we want control, right? We said that's the basis of complaining, is either just you know, getting things off our chest, or we want some, we want some control over things. 
uh, miraculous protection, a big show, um, something that looks amazing to other people. But what we really, really need, and we've learned this only through the desert, is we need God's word more than we need bread. We need God's glory more than we need our own. And we need God's will more than we need any show of might or show of ministry. What we're looking for in the desert is God's word, God's glory, and God's will. And um, those are the lessons that we are always going to learn in the desert. So seeds in the desert are often used by God to prepare us to bear fruit. Let's just take a few seconds and think about what God might be calling us to and ways in which we might be striving to answer that call on our own strength and ways that we should turn those things over to God's will, God's word, and God's glory. So let's just take a few seconds. Okay, so we talked about the search for sustenance and who we depend on for stability. We talked about uh, course corrections that God might be doing. We talked about uh, misapplying our call. Um, now we're going to talk about the way out. You are here. You are here in the desert, maybe. And how do we get out of here? Okay, we learned a lot, I think, about how to get out. Let's return to our focus verses. I'm just gonna read them. Please read them with me again. Some wandered in desert place, finding no way to a city to dwell in. Hungry and thirsty, their soul fainted within them. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble and he delivered them from their distress. He led them by a straight way till they reached a city to dwell in. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love for his wondrous work to the children of man, for he satisfies the longing soul and the hungry soul he fills with good things. The first thing that they did, I'm gonna go back one. The first thing that they did when they found themselves in desert waste, uh, they cried to the Lord in their trouble. They cried in humility, not in complaint, but in lament. They cried with the humility of someone who learned to pick up their food off of the ground and depend on the Lord to place that food there for them. They cried to the Lord in their trouble. Uh, he led them by a straight way. They had to be willing to be led in that straight way that he prepared for them. They had to accept the thorns and accept the walls that he had them in with so that he could allure them like he did with Gomer, like he does with us. Um, to a new place. He ha they had to be accepting of the endurance that the desert was building in them. Um, till they reached the city to dwell in, they had to be willing to enter the city. Uh, a city offers protection. It offers walls and safety. Um, it offers community and people. People, protection and purpose, so it offers people, community, people to minister alongside of people to minister to. Um, it offers purpose, the working out of that ministry that he's called you to. And the thing about the city is, um, we know that uh, in Hebrews it says they longed for a city whose builder and maker is God. It all belongs to God, it starts with him and it ends with him. And we trust in him to build that and to make it ready for us and so that we can follow him and go to it. And the last thing that they do is we give thanks. We give thanks to the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wondrous works to the children of man, for he satisfies the longing soul and the hungry soul he fills with good things. That's what I have. Wow. Wow. It's like a I gift really wrapped up in a little present, big gift here, take, you know. <laughs> I encourage you to look at the book because there's a lot that 
just just by the length of time that there is that we the short time we have together there's a lot that you have to kind of skip over mm -hmm. so i do encourage you to look at the book no this is great um we know the book has a lot more content but mm -hmm. for our purposes god guides us and the holy spirit leads you and beverly and all of us to kind of bring the word you know bring the word for this moment this space this time yeah beverly you know i um something that pamela was saying kind of just segs right in to um part that i wasn't able to speak about last week um and uh it's it's actually it's a significant part um that we were talking about what happened in the garden with the serpent and eve and so, as you know, Eve was tricked. Eve, Eve decided that, you know, God was withholding something powerful from them. And so she went ahead with what the, um, the serpent had asked her to do. And there's, there's this real tragic irony um, in all of this. It's a very, very tragic story because when we read in Genesis 3, 6, it says the woman saw that the tree was good for food that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise. And then she took and she ate of it. Well, back in Genesis two, the scripture already said in verse nine, and out of the ground, the Lord God made every tree grow that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. And God himself was with them. So he was imparting wisdom to them before their, their relationship was severed. So, so this, it's a real tragic irony that the, the enemy got her to make this decision when they already had everything. She mm. used her faculties to make the decision that this is good for food, it's pleasant to the eyes, and it's desired to give one wisdom, but that had already been provided by God. Mm. Um, and so when Jesus comes into this confrontation with the devil, First of all, as a human being, he has to do better than what Eve did. This is a replay. <laughs> and, you know, this, this is a replay of what happened in the garden. Um, and, and this is, this is um, just this is um, my, my, my human mind looking through this. Um, and and Eve, was, Eve was given the offer of enlightenment, which is, is power, is power. Jesus is, is being said, make use your miraculous powers to save yourself hmm. right that's what the devil's asking you know he's asking use use this as an opportunity to give glory to yourself and to build your ego right um this is um you know abuse your privilege of the angels coming to minister to you this is pretty much what the devil is offering him and jesus as a human being <clears throat> has to do a lot better than what Eve did. And because he is all God and all man, he knows exactly how to handle this because he still has the authority. Even though he's, he's, um, he's hungry, he's weak, he's, he's enduring this, this, this real temptation, um, it serves a purpose. It serves a purpose to show that he really truly is the perfect sacrifice. Um, so, so this is, I'm, I'm, I'm in my human wisdom, I'm thinking this is certainly why the Holy Spirit led him there because he had to prove that he is the perfect sacrifice mm -hmm. and being offered all of these things, any one of those things, if he'd fallen for any <clears throat> one of those things as a human being, then that would have removed his perfection immediately. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so, so that's my thought. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Beverly. Um, Carolyn, did you want to say something or no? No. Nope. Okay. Okay. Um, Gina, you with yeah. us, right? Amen. Right here. <laughs> I just had it off because I didn't want to distract. I had a lot of hallelujahs and amen. You can throw the hallelujahs <laughs> in there. In fact, I encourage that. But um, what I was going to say was, you have any thoughts before I share something? Go ahead. <laughs> Hi. Hi, Carolyn. I just wanted to hi. come off video to say hi, hi to Carolyn. Hi. Um, I have so many. I just, I, 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 mm -hmm. I love how you brought us through. And uh, Sister Pamela, right before you, uh, you said, there's so much in the book, I was going to come off and say, how did you pick that? 
mm-hmm. to choose. And then I think it was you, um, Becky, that you said the Holy Spirit letter. So you answered my question before I even had to say it. Like, how did you, you know, yeah. I, I, I love it when God does this because it's something that I needed to hear and feel. And I've been reading um, the book of Hosea uh, mm. in the last month or so, you know, yeah. going back to it. So I really did appreciate that to have the breakdown differently. Cause sometimes when you're by yourself trying to break it down, it's not as easy. So I appreciate that. Thank Amen. you. Praise the Lord. I'm so excited about today. I'm telling you, God is so good. I'll tell you why. Um, Pamela doesn't know this and, and, and others, but there's a book by Donald Jacobson. It's called Global Christianity. And Global Christianity, I'm not recommending the book or whatever. I'm just telling you where I got what I'm going to tell you, okay? And in that book, which is a wonderful book, <laughs> um, it talks about Christianity in all parts of the world. And this week, two weeks now, I've been focused on the part of the world called Africa. <laughs> now, Africa is a very dry place right? We all know that, right? Uh, Where Jesus, where God placed his only son was a very dry place, okay? Where the word of God came to man here on earth was a very arid, dry, impoverished, sometimes forsaken place of persecution, of drought, um, violence, a lot of things, right? And I found out that um, we all think about Christianity, the beginnings, Catholic church, you know, beyond that, the apostolic church and all that. And then, you know, Paul goes one way to the West, right? And Mark goes another way, goes the other way, the Eastern way, because there was no other way to go because they're killing Paul in the West. They're killing Peter upside down in the West, right? They're, so you have to go the other way. So when you go the other way, you head, you know, toward the Eastern and then the other churches form and God has this miracle, wonderful way of working with people in their time. And in that time, these Christians ended up in Africa, Mark, right? Ended up ministering to people in Africa. And in Africa, it turns out that there are these wonderful places where people took the actual word of God that was shared by the apostles. It was hidden in the desert. And that these Syriac Christians, these Coptic Christians, these Ethiopian Christians, Egyptian Christians in Alexandria were in charge of keeping the intact word of God as they had received it from the apostles, from the early church, from the people who had been with Jesus. And then I find out that as it goes forth, you know, many, many centuries, 500 years, thousands of years, um, they survive. Other religions and other controversies (laughs) Don't. but these people who keep the word of God survive, right? And um, the Muslims come, they overtake North Africa, but there's a certain part of Africa that still believes the word of God as it was received. And so I'm just telling you that I don't know why God had me in that, you know, now in this season, but I can tell you that in the arid places is where the, the word of God comes, you know, like a fountain right? To refresh, right? To, to water the areas. Israel has places that I was there in 86. I went to a kibbutz and one of these young people was telling me was that Israel was a place that uh, was very arid, but the Israeli people have been able to have these gardens in the middle of the desert. You know, they found a way. And I just want to say that God finds a way to reach us in these places. And sometimes they are, mm-hmm. we are deliberately there and we don't even know it. It's, mm-hmm. it's by God's design because he needs us to understand. Pamela, if you could put up that one slide, it's, it's in Deuteronomy. I can't remember the scripture, but it was the one where you talked about um, what they were doing there, the preparation, the, you know, this is all very important. I go through arid spaces and, and in, the, and in the, um, the desperation of the moments, we don't know what to do. We really don't know what to do. And so God is reminding us, and you shall remember the whole way that the Lord your God has led you, right? Has led you throughout, that he can humble you, test you, know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. You know, what Beverly was talking about, how there are places that of temptation, but there are also places like Gomer, you know, 
there, this is just all these wonderful things. And I just want to tell you, I, I don't know what you may be going through right now. I know what Louisa is going through. I know what Donna is going through, right? Yeah. I know what Polly is going through. Yes. But there are some of you, you may be going through stuff in a desert all by yourself. And that loneliness is a, is a dangerous place to be if you're not in the word, if you're not in worship. Last week, the last time we met, we were talking about worship, how important that is to refresh your soul. You know, even when you can't pray, but you can sing maybe, or you can't sing, but you can utter a word of praise. It brings life, right? Amen. Some of those songs, I'm telling you, some of those hymns from ancient past yeah. bring in a way that brings this right here to remembrance from here to here, you know, this connection, mm -hmm. you know, there's another thing you said about um, <clears throat> vertical. Can you remind me what that was? That was um, lament is vertical. Vertical. Correct. That's what the children of Israel were doing. When we first got together in January, we we're talking about lamentations and the difference, right? Between between uh, sorrow and lamenting, when you lament vertically, you're talking to God, right? Mm. You're, you're returning to a place of conversation with God. What is going on here, God? What what is, what is all this? You know, mm. what what? Why do I have to go through this? You know, the righteous are never forsaken. So, what is going on? Those questions have to be <clears throat> asked. Cry out. That's what what um. What Pamela was talking about, we have to cry out and say, Lord, Lord, my Lord, how many times David cry out, you know, in the desert, by the way. Okay. Mm -hmm. Where does the tabernacle go? In the desert. Mm -hmm. You know, just like mm -hmm. it's just it's just a beautiful, a beautiful picture of uh he is the giver of life, he is a source of strength, right? The sustenance, water, what he spoke to. With the woman at the well trying to get water if you only knew if you only knew who was asking you for a drink right um so i'm not, i know i'm all over the place but i know that god is speaking to us about mm -hmm. about um talking to him waiting on him in this moment of dry spell right because these are seasons so sometimes we're in a dry spell with our parents sometimes we're in a dry spell with our children Sometimes we're in a dry spell with our relationships in general. Uh, sometimes we're in a dry spell sitting in the pew in church. Mm -hmm. You know, when you feel like you're all alone and you're surrounded by a hundred people. Ever been there? Mm -hmm. right? And we're all saying, yes, Lord. <laughs> yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Right? Mm -hmm. But we're alone. And so we're not really, but we feel that way. So it's another temptation of the flesh. It's another way that God reminds us, you know, I'm your God. You're my people. You know, I, you're never alone. Amen. Um, Amen. I will I, just um, say one thing yeah. that you just said about, you know, um, sometimes we don't think that like we have the words, but the Lord will hear our groans yeah. and our grunts. Even if we can't, Psalms 5, This I have a book where I keep my favorite verses. And Psalms 5, 1 through 2, give ear to my words, O Lord, consider my groaning. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of places in the Bible that it says just to make a sound, you know, give attention mm -hmm. to the sound of my cry, my King and my God, for to you do I pray. It's one mm -hmm. of my favorites. Mm -hmm. um, Amen. But yeah, but and, and I often have to remind myself, like, um, twice this week I had terrible panic attacks one was yesterday mm. that's why I had to join and it was a quarter after seven and the Lord reminded me that you guys were on you know like he whispered to me so I mm. jumped on you know and I, I sometimes I can't speak I can't mm -hmm. but all I can do is groan mm -hmm. and I'm making some sound for him to come to me mm -hmm. or to release me of that anxiety you know mm -hmm. beautiful mm -hmm. God is great Amen. And the insecurity that comes to us is also, you know, a, a source of, of, it tries to diminish us, you know, but we're not, we're more than conquerors, right? Amen. We are, you know? Um, so I just thank you, Pamela, for that. Um, I encourage all of you to continue to pray individually, but together as well, you know, very important. Um, 
I know that a lot of people like Zoom and I know that I'm still working on it. Um, but I'll tell you Y'all doing fine. Y'all doing just the, fine. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. <laughs> I'm still working on it. But I'll tell you this. What I like about the vehicle and the, the blessing that Zoom is in our pandemic time is that I can still see you. And so I encourage you that when we're together, I don't want to say this on Wednesday night. I don't want to say this on Friday night when we pray, but just a thought, a suggestion. <laughs> I know that we turn the screens off because we're busy. Something's going on in the background. You don't want us to see. I get it. Okay. I, I've been there. But seeing us together, learning, praying is a part of the community that God wants us to have that we were talking about. So I encourage you in, if I don't, not, not, you know, not, if you have to turn your screens off for a minute, I get it. It's not a problem, you know, but try to, try to be here and present as much as you can, because this is where we can really see, feel and minister to you, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and I say that with all, with no, no, um, what's it? No pressure. Okay. <laughs> mm -hmm. No pressure. Just, just a thought that I think that God wants to minister to us more. I can't wait till we don't have to do this this way all the time, where we can have some coffee together somewhere <laughs> soon, you know, but, um, but I, I appreciate that. So what is the next, does anyone remember? I don't have the book in front of me. I left it at work. What's can the I next? Ask what, the, what the book is? Do I okay, not so put know it right what the up. book is? Yeah, Beverly. And by the way, if anybody wants it, I have extra copies. I just don't have them here. I'm in the car. Yeah, um, hold on. Hold on. I'm, I'm looking for the last chapter too. Hold on. It's, it's okay, so this is the book. It's called Steadfast Love. It's yeah, by Lauren Chandler. Oh, okay. Chandler, and it's Psalm 107. But yeah. we're using it as a framework. We're not really, um, that's why we didn't really send it to you guys because we are using it as a framework sure. and we're letting the Holy Spirit guide us <clears throat> the way we need to minister uh, at this time. Okay. okay. Uh, any questions, comments, any uh, prayer requests or anything before we go? Um, next time you, you were asking what the next lesson was. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And the next lesson is um, about chains. And mm -hmm. we read through um, Psalm 107 verses 10 through 16. Okay. Um, and it talks about how heavy they are. Um, it talks about, um, you know, they're, they're painful. It talks about God most high. Mm -hmm. um, and um, it goes through, it goes through quite a lot of out of darkness. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's, it's quite a, quite an important chapter. It looks like. Amen. Amen. Well, so we've been through worship. The second we just did was desert and now we're going to the chains. Okay. Next time we're going to talk about what that's about. Um, so unless there's any other prayer request or anything, I'm just going to close and I'm so happy to thank you, Carolyn and Gina for joining us. I appreciate that. A lot of people, uh, texted that they were, some people are going through the dry spaces. We need to pray for them. It's not easy. Um, so they're not here or they're busy. So just keep praying for Joy. Keep praying for Louisa. Keep praying for Shay, for Hazel, Larney, all of them. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I just want to say one last thing, you guys. Yeah. Thank you for um, being so gentle and so kind and letting the Lord lead you and being obedient to him and continuing to have this uh, Bible study. So I, I really, really, Amen. really thank you for that. Thank you, Georgina. Yeah. yeah. Uh, one thing I can say about Pamela and Beverly is that, <clears throat> you know, the Lord definitely uses them in that way to gracefully bring real deep truths of the word. And so I, I, I am grateful. Amen. Amen. Let's Amen. pray. Sweet Jesus, Amen. we thank you. We Amen. give you glory. We give you praise. Let's take a moment to just thank him. Amen. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We worship you. We honor you. We give you glory, Lord God. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your word, Lord God. Thank you for saving us. Thank you for healing us. Thank you for giving us, Father, Father to drink of your word. Father, sustenance through your word, Father God. Thank you that you speak to us in moments when we least expect it, Lord God. You are speaking to us at all times. 
Lord Jesus, I pray for my life, Lord God, and the lives of my friends, Father God, that you will continue to help us to draw from the fountain of life, Lord Jesus, to help us to know how to do that in every situation. Father, that in the arid spaces, Father, we still have time to be refreshed and renewed by you and by your Holy Spirit, Father. Change in us, Father. Do the changes, Father, and the transformations we need in those spaces and teach us so that we can come out of it and teach others how to walk this walk, Father God. To teach others how to fight the good fight, Lord Jesus. So I pray you strengthen Louisa, Father. I, I pray you strengthen and heal Donna, Lord God. I, I pray you strengthen Georgina, Father God, through it all, Father God. I pray you, you help her as she goes, Father, to minister to others, Father, during this time of loss. Father, I pray that you bless her and that you give her words of life and speak life into every situation and the people she sees, Father. I thank you for Carolyn, Lord Jesus. I pray, Lord God, that you continue to bless her, anoint her, Father, with your gifts, Father, to worship and to praise you, Father God. I pray that you continue to bless her family, Father God, her children, Lord Jesus. Would you increase their faith, Lord God, in every situation? I thank you that you held them together, Father, these past several weeks. Father, that you, Father, lifted them up, Father, from, from every uh, disease, Father, and illness, Father God, and virus, Lord God. You saved them from all that, Father God. I thank you that they are here and strong. I thank you that they were there for Regina, Lord God, for her situation, for the loss of their son, that they were able to hold them and to be together as a family during this terrible time and this terrible tragedy, Lord Jesus. But I thank you that she can minister to them, that she can have opportunity to speak to her family about you, about your love, about your salvation, Father God. So I, I bless your name for her life. I pray that you bring, Father, renewal in her life and refreshment in her life as always you are with her, Father. Lord, I thank you for Pamela, Lord God, and for Beverly, Lord Jesus. I thank you for their faithfulness, Lord God. I thank you that they love you and they love your word and they take time, precious time, Lord Jesus, to put together, Father, your word in ways that are easy to understand and easy to digest, Father God, and easy, Lord God, for you to nourish through the power of your Holy Spirit. Lord God, lead us, Father. Lead Prosway, Father. Lead, Father God, the church in, uh, Father father uh father in in stanford lead the church lord jesus first assembly lead the pastors and the leaders lord god there are women in each of those places i pray you, you bless them give them wisdom that they could continue to minister to larger groups of women to go beside women lord god to help each one to understand you. lord father give us the strength to continue to labor to do the work you have called us to do lord god Father, this is a beautiful day. The sun is shining, Lord. Help us to enjoy the Sabbath of rest somehow, Father, in this day, in this weekend, Lord God. And help us, Lord God, to be renewed, Lord Jesus. Not to forget who you are. Not to forget what you've done. Not to forget who you love us. Father, that tomorrow when we get together and worship, Father, our praise rises up, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. That our trust in you, Father, would be ebullient, Lord God, that, and our praise and, and everything would overflow, Lord Jesus, it can be a blessing, and that you might be exalted, Lord Jesus. Father, speak to us each and every day and help us to listen, Father God, carefully to your words as you speak to us, Father, through this psalm, Lord God, Psalm 107, continue to minister to us. <clears throat> through it, Lord God. Continue to minister in those places. Continue to reveal the hidden spaces, Father, that we don't recognize in our natural sense. But Lord, in the spirit, you can show us, Father, through the mirror of your word, what those hidden places that need attention are, Father God. So Lord, I thank you. I praise you for today. I give Hallelujah. you glory. Holy Spirit of God, be with us. Holy Spirit of God, minister. Holy Spirit of God, teach us. Holy Spirit of God, we worship you, Father. Holy Spirit of God, we honor you, Father. Continue, Lord God, to do the work. Father, we ask you all these things in the precious, beautiful name of your son, Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen. Oh, Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. 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 May blessed be the and name hallelujah. of the Lord. Blessed. Hallelujah. Blessed yeah. are we that we can get amen. together and talk about Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise the Lord. So thank you. Amen. Have a beautiful day. Thank you Love again, Pamela. And uh Georgina, are you when are you leaving on your trip? Uh Arizona's pushed back. Woo. Oh, okay. So I'm around. Okay. Praise so God. Maybe, I am around. Right. 
All right, so we, we miss you there. when you're. Thank you for um for being with us. Uh, when you can come out. I'll Last see you tomorrow. Week. We're gonna rejoice for Lardy. Come out tomorrow. <laughs> I will be. I'll see you tomorrow. We're gonna right. rejoice for Lardy. Is it Lardy coming? Lardy's well, coming tomorrow. She's some of those Filipino noodles. She said, "I don't." Know. <laughs> uh, praise God! I'll see you tomorrow. They're delicious. Lord willing. Huh? Lord willing, Amen. We'll see you tomorrow. Amen. 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 Thank you, Carolyn. God bless. Thank you. Thank you, bye guys. Bye. Thank you, Pamela. Thank mm -hmm. you. God bless. Bye-bye. Uh,